Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Murray. I'm the tech coach for Vermilion Local Schools. Thank you for staying, 345. Wow, when I saw that time, I was like, for real? Especially since I was in military time. Anyway, um, I'm here with two of my colleagues, Zach Brock and Paula Burskin. And today we're going to present to you um, our journey in blended learning and flipping the classroom. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Our goals today. Basically, we want to show you what uh, blended learning looks like. Um, tell you how we apply it in our classrooms, give you feedback from people who use it, and try to give you the how along with the why. A lot of times in conferences like this, you hear a whole lot of, uh, you should try this technique, but not necessarily how to implement it. And so we wanted to give you something that you can take with you as opposed to just more theory. So good luck. <laughs> so I have the definition for blended learning, but really where I want to tell you our start or our journey began was kind of an accident. So it wasn't something that we just said, oh, we're going to go ahead and start blended learning next year. No. We are a one-to-one -one school district, and we had um, problems. So we had our technology out there. We have iPods in K-5. So each one of our students in K-5 has an iPod Touch. And our students in 6 through 12 have MacBooks. And um, we went ahead and rolled out all those to our students and found out that we had difficulty managing different things. So we could get work from our students, but we had no way to give it back. Um, we couldn't really interact with them. So we were kind of substituting technology instead of really integrating it. And um, we began a journey of looking for a way to ease things for our teachers. And that's how we started in blended learning. Um, blended learning can look like many different things. In our district, that's what it is. It's, we have a virtual academy, and it's students who weren't very successful in our school buildings. We were sending them to other districts, and we found out that we really needed to keep that enrollment in our district. And so we started looking for ways to keep our students, and one way is to go ahead and open our virtual academy. And our virtual academy is um, a little different. Students are only required to come in two hours a day. And then they go home and they work from home. Um, we do have a certified teacher who's there. She monitors what students are doing and um, makes sure that they stay on track. And if they're having difficulty, then of course they stay a little longer during the school day. Um, the second thing we did is we implemented an intervention program. And the intervention program, we um, got Play-Doh software, and we did assessments. So we do the benchmark assessment test. All of our students take them in the fall, and a prescription is generated from that. And those students all go to um, a class for 30 minutes a day where they're working on a prescription right for that benchmark test to help them pass. And we do this three times a year. Our online courses, um, we have online courses offered through Florida Virtual School. And we're just now starting to get into that. And we have um, blended learning. So that's where our teachers are taking their things that they do in their class and moving them all to one place so that their students only have to access one site and can find all the information there. Keys to our success, well, our first year was kind of a trial run. We had these iPod Touches. We were a PC building moving into MacBooks. So um, we had to make sure that we found the correct computer. And although we ran into little bumps in the road when we asked our teachers, they all decided that, yes, this was the thing we should do. We should have gone with the MacBook. And um, nobody was upset about that. Our second thing we started to do is look for a learning management system. We needed a way to get graded work to and from our students to um, make comments, communicate with our students. We didn't want them all over the place. We wanted them in one place. We also had teachers who were at different levels. And at first, we started with, oh, here's Google Docs, and here's a wiki, and here's a blog. And there were so many things, they didn't know when to use what. So by curtailing that and getting a learning management system, we could focus on the learning management system and putting things in there to change our teaching. 
Um, in order to do that, we are a very small district. We have one elementary, one middle, and one high school. And um, we spent a lot of money getting our iPod Touches and our MacBooks, so we had to do something to get software. We joined a consortium. We joined with Spark. So we're up on the shores of Lake Erie, and Spark Consortium is down in Canton, Ohio. Um, this advantage was advantageous to us because um, we, when we go in and talk to people about software and software pricing, we don't have the number of students that a Canton would have or um, Maslin would have. Our school is much smaller. So when we're talking about pricing for software, it was things that we really couldn't afford. So going through a consortium um, gave us that advantage. We were able to access 43 online um, classes or courses through Florida Virtual. We could have never purchased those on our own. And um, not only that, I am the only uh, tech coach for our district. So it's kind of nice because we meet once a month and I can bounce off ideas. Spark has been in the online blended learning a lot longer than we have, so it was kind of nice to have somebody hold our hand and take us on the journey. Um, the last thing we did, are my two colleagues here, we had to find other people. I couldn't be in every room and every building at the same time. So we designated 15 teachers in our district that are doing the training. So we started off first. We had Apple trainers come. We um, looked to Lika. We had different consultants that we hired. Bottom line was nobody knew our students or our teachers like we did. And when we started doing the training ourselves and designing it ourselves, our teachers decided that was the best training they had. They weren't afraid to ask us questions. They weren't afraid to tell us to slow down. Um, it changed the climate in our buildings. Before we were probably more of, I'm gonna go in my classroom and do my own thing. Now you hear teachers saying, oh, I wanna try this, but I'm not sure how to go and do it. There's three other teachers who will help them, or believe it or not, 15 kids that will come up there and help them out. So we're not afraid to ask for help wherever it is. So what does it look like in our buildings? It looks a little different in each of our buildings. Do you want to do this part? Sure. Main thing is we see people engaging with the technology. Um, Let's face the fact that students love to work with computers all day, all night. Um, so when you give them tools that they relate to, that they're comfortable with, things just whoosh, go crazy from there. Um, so we see kids becoming more engaged with the lessons, doing more advanced things, um, finding ways to really you know, show us what they're made of. And we see the teachers becoming more facilitators Here's, here's the end goal, here's the problem, now find a solution. We find that giving students the tools to be more creative and you know, kind of take the learning into their hands a little bit more is, is a great technique for us. And focusing on those students and less on you know, the teacher up in the front of the room gives the teacher more flexibility to help those kids who need help and to kind of guide those who need um, you know, just that extra little nudge. We can differentiate up, down, whatever. It frees the teacher up to do a lot more things with the students for their benefit. Not only does it help the students, but it can help you. Um, the main thing I've noticed is flexibility. When we went to trying blended options and working with the technology, my life got easier. Um, I'm the kind of person, um, Paperwork is my antithesis, so if I could find ways to streamline or simplify those things, it was fantastic for me. I've run almost a paperless classroom this year. Um, they turn in things through our learning management system. They go back out. We put videos in the Dropbox. I can watch a skit that a student made a second period from my couch at 9.30 at night, and that's fantastic. I can focus on the details. I can't miss something off the side, or if I turn around to yell at a kid for screaming during a presentation, I don't miss what they said during you know, their time on stage. So it's just been really nice to give me the flexibility to grade and, and be the best teacher I can be. And having the technology and the blended classroom has solved the, oh my God, what did the substitute do while I was gone syndrome that I'm sure we're all gonna have to deal with when we come back um, from this conference by 
having all the technology there and having the lesson plans and having the learning management system, I can spell out in my words, I can give a demo video, I can put all that content out there so the students know exactly what's expected of them at home or in school and not have to worry about any substitute interference. Um, keeps you organized. Like I said, if we find a learning management system that works for you, that's key critical number one. Um, we're still working out a couple of issues with ours where ours doesn't quite integrate with our grade book, so there's some issues there. But if you can find one that's all one package, that's what I would totally recommend. Um, like I said, paperwork is, is my bane. So if I have one place, where did I leave that homework assignment? Where did, um, where did I leave that presentation? If it's all uploaded to the learning management system, I never have to worry about the student who is absent that day and dig through a pile of paperwork. I can just say, go to the learning management system, check it out. You know, it's the third page of notes. Do your thing. Um, and then we've had a couple of examples of students who have gotten ill. Like we've got one who is uh, leukemia, I think now, and there's some other people who depend on the the technology to provide, you know, classroom assistance with them. They can go in, see the work, see what's expected of them, read the excerpt that has been published, and stay on top of their schooling from home. It's not a virtual academy or anything. They're still getting classroom instruction from their classroom teacher in, you know, times of of distress. So that's been really handy to keep ourselves and our students on board. Differentiation, the buzzword from at least three, three years ago still circling around like mad. Um, our LMS and our blended learning program has helped build strength and uh, reinforce weaknesses. If we can build lessons that allow them to show off what they can do, fantastic. They get better at things they're already doing finding ways to address their weaknesses also as important. So we can say, all right, we've got all these tools, these technologies, you're not so good at you know, this part of grammar, you can work on a project focusing on this, while you can work on a project focusing on this, and really differentiate the content of the lessons. So having the blended learning environment has really helped balance our student needs. So picking back what um, Zach was saying, we um, have students who I'm sure you say, oh, if I tell them one more time, I'm going to just scream. And we don't have that anymore because we have teachers now who, especially in our elementary building, they're starting to videotape themselves, giving directions for center work, um, those kind of directions that they need over and over. The students, they um, go ahead and record it, and students can go and they can listen to it as many times as they need. So that has been very helpful to our younger set of students. Um, we also find that our older students, especially in the middle school, they're willing to do that too, because our learning management system grades for us, and believe me, those kids may seem like they're not very interested, but when that grade pops up and it doesn't look quite right, they're doing it over and over and over again. So the examples that I have up on um, the front board, um, you actually see an intervention group going on, and um, the teacher actually has time to work with her students one-on-one. -on -one. The students that are on the laptop are actually working in Play-Doh. Um, they took that benchmark test, they had a prescription generated for it, and they're working on skills that they need extra practice in. And the other one is actually a first grade classroom, and it's again the same thing, that's Play-Doh, but they're not all doing reading. We have some students who are really strong in reading but struggled in math. So at the same time, well, you can see the teacher off in the corner working with someone. Um, they're able to work on either reading or math, even uh, at a young age by themselves. And the thing that I was struck by um, in the first grade class, usually you go in and it's like a whole bunch of ants running around and I shouldn't say running around, but you know, they're busy. And um, I walked in and the room was completely quiet. All the kids were interacting with it. They were like, look at what I got on here. Look, it says you did it. I've got a new um, zebra in here. So they were so excited about the things they were doing. And it was the quietest I've ever seen the group and they were all really engaged in what they were doing. So <coughs> the other factor that goes into is what can you do with the technology once you've got it? And I've noticed in, in my practice, the absolute number one thing that it gives me is options. 
Um, for one class, I can have one you know, group doing a skit, one that's doing a presentation, one who's doing a paper, one who feels most comfortable taking a paper test, you know, making diagrams, things like that. Having the tools readily available allows the students to choose things um, that are more creative, interesting, use multimedia presentations. They can find a video, they can narrate over it, they can create something on their own. Having the technology there to facilitate that has been fantastic. I have a 15-year-old son, and um, he's not too excited when I ask him about work. It's kind of, yeah, I don't know, I have some, uh, and you know, he kind of mumbles under his breath. Um, I have to ask him several times to get a straight answer of, uh, are, do you sh are you sure you don't have anything you have to work on? And um, this is one of his history projects from our ninth grade class. They were setting his idea, or his group had to work on um, what an administration does during war and how they're not in it. So they took YouTube clips to put together and they've actually narrated through it. Now, um, this is a group of four boys who worked on it over a weekend and they used <laughs> Facebook to contact each other back and forth, send messages to each other. Um, I never had to ask him once, where are you with that? Because he was busy doing it and they were interacting on it. And so um, this is just one example of what's going on in our high school. All right, um, I te teach a little bit different. The, the really nice thing about the blended learning is that each teacher has their own way of teaching. And because each teacher has their own way of doing things um, with the blended learning, we can apply as much or as little technology and um, we can apply it the way we want to. For me, I teach sixth grade math and science. And I teach a flipped classroom for math. My science classes are not flipped, but we, we do use a lot of the blended learning. With my students, I asked them what they thought of the blended learning and the flipped classrooms. And this is just some of their, um, like I said, sixth grade, this is some of their ideas on it. And, and I won't read them all, but one student said, blended learning has helped me learn by doing things visually and physically. It's also saved papers from getting lost, and I always have my notes, study guides, or homework with me all the time. So I can look back on it or so I don't forget it at school. This is a big thing for sixth graders. We go through a lot of organization in sixth grade. I remember where you, know, you walk in and it's like, okay, where's the paper I gave you yesterday? Um, I, I think it's in my locker. So you'd have six kids get up and go to their locker. Five of them would come back without it. It's like, well, where else could it be? Well, it could be in so-and-so's locker. Okay, go to their locker. So they'd go out again. This has saved us a lot of that. And now we have um, the students a lot more organized. They have their stuff right there. Sometimes they still have trouble finding it because they didn't save it properly. And you have to help them by going through. But the blended learning really has helped them become more organized. And you'll see if you read through this that it also they're they're also talking about they they get the chance to learn it over again. In my flipped classroom, we have what we call ahas at home assignments. My students will, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. My students watch videos at night of me teaching math, and then they take notes on that. If they don't understand it, they can watch it over and over again, as opposed to being in my classroom where I teach it and then we try to apply it, and if they didn't want to ask questions in front of somebody, and, and most of them won't in middle school, then they just kind of push it to the side like, well, I'll get it later, and they never do. Another thing that's helped is when our students are absent, they're going to that Brain Honey, and that's our learning management system, and looking for something to do. So I did have a student who one of the teachers referred to me, and he came down to my office and I said, oh, I hear you took your benchmark test from home. And he said, yeah, I went on um, Brain Honey, I couldn't find an assignment, so I went to um, Plato and I found out that I had to do the benchmark test, so I went ahead and did it. And the teacher was very upset because he did it at home and I'm sitting here going, hmm. I mean, he knew to go and look for something and he knew where to find it and he wanted to keep up in his class. So I thought, that, okay, um, next time I'll put a little password or something on it so he can't get it to it at home, but was it a wrong thing to do? I'm not sure. <laughs> so in our um, elementary classroom, 
I did say we have iPod touches and we use them in a variety of ways. The first way you see is a little girl, she is learning sight words and um, that's her iPod touch and she's in kindergarten. Um, the next group is a group that's working on Play-Doh. In our library, we have t um, students who can check out books using their iPod touch. And on the very bottom, using the iPod touch, I had an art class that was studying Monet and Georgia O'Keeffe, and those are some of the things that they did using their iPod Touch. At the middle school, this is just an example of one of the things we did in my science class. Um, the students had to find volume of regular and irregular shaped objects. Normally, when we're doing this, I have 26 kids, and I would have to go around and watch them do it to make sure they knew what they were doing. Instead, I had them take pictures of themselves doing it, and you'll see they were allowed for the regular shaped object, they were allowed to do three photos that they took of themselves, and then underneath each one, they're explaining what they had to do to find the volume. And then for the irregular object, the same thing. There are a lot of things that we use the MacBook for in our science classes. A lot of our labs, everything is on the MacBook. They just put all their information in there. They take videos of themselves doing labs. So it's really helped them as far as um, being able to understand it because they'll sit back and they'll watch those videos over and over. They love to watch themselves. So they'll watch those videos over and over again or they'll look at that and say, um, well, I'm, I can probably do this better. They'll come up to me and they'll want to redo stuff. In the high school environment, we obviously focus more on you know, the research and the in-depth intellectual shenanigans. And this is just a, a video that one student put together in a class period, just trying to show all these different concepts you can do through the technology that you may not be able to do. I think I muted it earlier. Oliver. According um. to an Associated Press report, although Weldon started last in the 34 card field and was still well behind the first wave of cars that got into trouble on the 12th lap, there was no time. So it's, it's her doing the same types of things she would do before. If I just said, all right, research this topic, write a paragraph about it, and you know, show me that you can express yourself, write a news article, do something like that, why not take it a step further? When she does a video like this, she's showing the same research skills. She's collaborating with a partner. She's building a script. She's giving attribution to sources. But she's doing it in a much more engaging, real-world applicable way. I teach uh, media communications and media technology classes, and so getting the kids out there and making a news broadcast or making a news story was a lot more relevant to my classroom than just writing a, a short article or writing some copy. So keeping, keeping the blended environment there has been awesome. So that's kind of our, our why, what we do. Our next step is where do we start? And as you can see, it was a little painful for some of our teachers at first, but um, we're all working together, and that's the main thing that we see most often. Like she said, we started with a group of, of teacher leaders, so people who were the, the guinea pigs. And we all got together and we said, where can we start? What can we do? Let's pick a lesson. Let's pick a unit. Um, find some ways to collaborate. Who's got some ideas? You know, what can we do? And I think having that pilot group was the absolute number one best thing we could have done to get people who were interested in the, the, the technology, who could get excited about it, find ways to creatively use it. If you just give it to everybody all at once and say, all right, have fun, you're going to have a whole bunch of people who are left behind. Um, a lot of us need to see, oh, they can do something great with that. I can do something great with it too. So starting with that teacher leader core group to really push the effort, I think, was a number one solid choice on our part. And finding a natural place to start. You really don't want to force it per se. Make the make the project relevant to the content. It's it's hard to cram, you know, the the square peg into the round hole proverbially. So make sure that you can find ways to make it real world, relevant, um, applicable to the content. Um, whenever we tried something that was just arbitrary, it fell flat. Technology for technology's sake is is no good. Find ways to make it relevant. And then finally, allow for the students to make it theirs. It's all fun when it's you know your idea, your brainchild, and getting the kids excited about something that they really care about gives them buy-in. So you look great because you give them an opportunity to shine themselves. So it's a, it's a great start. 
And it looked very different in all three buildings. So at our elementary building, we um, have laptop carts that they have to share and um, the iPod touches. Our um, LMS works better on the MacBooks than it does on our iPod touches. And what started for our elementary, they had to find a way that this learning management system was going to work for them. So they started with taking their tests, like reading tests that they had to give at the end of a story. Um, then it went to unit test. So they had to find one way to incorporate it, and that was the best way for them to start, is to take those tests and have students start taking it. And of course, you know, you're going to hear some feedback we did about, oh, what do you mean I have to type the whole thing in? But they found out that, yes, there was time spent on the front end where we did have to type and recreate some of these tests. But on the other end, now it makes grading a lot easier. All multiple choice tests are graded for us, and they're there. Um, any kind of essay question pops up at the top, and the teacher can go ahead and click how many points each one's worth. So um, that's worked best for our elementary building. They're now getting into videotaping, so if you're kind of like me, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in front of a camera and you're going to tape me? I don't think so. Well, that's one of the things that have really taken off with our teachers, and we thought it was going to be a big breaks. But as they started to see the advantage of their students just watching those videos and not having to give directions over and over again, now they're creating videos and sharing them. So um, one teacher might do the videos for the centers for this week in second grade, and all teachers might show it. Maybe somebody's doing a math lesson, and they're, they're all sharing it using our learning management system. So that was the bonus with the management system that we picked. Um, in the middle school, uh, they have a variety of things that are going on. Do you want to talk about that? The middle school, how blended learning works there? Sure. At the middle school, it's a little bit different. Um, the grades, we have, uh, our middle school is four through seven. Sixth and seventh grade have MacBooks, so there's a lot we can do with that because the students take the MacBooks home with them. We do a lot with having them take ownership. They will come up with ideas. We just did a, a recently in math something on decimals. Well, at the end of it, they had to find like sales tip and percents. And, and at the end, they had to create their own. They had to go shopping. And they had parameters they had. And then they could buy what, whatever they wanted within these parameters. And they had to create some way to show me what they bought. They also had to go to lunch. They had to buy lunch for themselves and to other people, meaning they also had to show how to find the tip and the... Um, the sales taxes for all of these. So there's a lot of ways that we could use this. They're, they're using the iPod Touch in fourth and fifth grade for, um, again, you know, they can use them. They have the carts also, but they can use them for tests. They can use them for a lot of practicing of the math facts. Things where the students will, maybe they were working on something and they got done, they can go grab an iPod and they can work on their math facts. So there's a lot of different ways that we're using it in the different buildings. The most intimidating thing is realizing that you don't know much more about the process than your students, and they'll try to catch you on it every time. So you need training, but also your students do. So make sure that you're not starting out with too massive a project. Find something that's manageable, you can stay ahead of the curve, and you don't want to be daunted by your own attempts at this. Otherwise, you just get demotivated, fall flat, give up, call it a day. So transition to the bigger stuff when you're comfortable. Um, some of us started with a project per unit and moved on and did it from there. Some of us started with you know, doing an entire unit because we started comfortable with it. So transition to building and incorporating more ideas when you're comfortable with it. But make sure that you're pushing your boundaries, too. Um, help the students push their boundaries, but also experiment. If something doesn't work, meh. You know, always, always take the opportunity to you know grow yourself along with your practice because stagnation, let's just face it, is boring. And I've had many things that have bombed. Believe me. Um, I, now I want to get into what the flipped classroom is. Like I told you before, I teach math and science for sixth grade. My science class is not flipped. It is um, the blended learning where we use everything in, in the MacBooks in there. However, my, my math class, 
I found over the last few years that I wasn't comfortable with where the students were and what they were doing. I was getting a lot of missed homework assignments. They weren't doing the homework because they'd go home and they didn't know what they were doing or they would miss a couple of days and then they wouldn't know what they were doing. They'd ask their parents for help and their parents would show them something that I have no idea what it was. Um, it wasn't anything like what we had taught them or, or what we were trying to teach them. So I had heard about something called Khan Academy and vi the videos that they did. Khan Academy is great for the high school, but it's not videos for the middle school. So I thought, well, let me see what I can do. I decided that I wanted to go ahead and make videos of myself teaching. So over the summer, I spent quite a few hours making videos of myself. Now, I got, um, my principal was kind enough to get a, a hover cam, which is like a document camera that does video, and send it home with me over the summer. I went ahead and made videos of myself teaching the lessons, and the, they're anywhere from five to, some, some of them might be 15 minutes long if it's a really difficult concept. So my students go home, um, on our learning management system, which we use Brain Honey, their AHA is on there, their at-home assignment. They watch that video, they take notes. They can watch it as many times as they want. I try to put different things on there besides my video. They know that they have to copy the notes that are on there, and they watch the videos. It may be videos from the actual textbook. We have an online textbook also, so I have videos that are on there. And I try to find games where they can practice some of those. Then they come to me the next day, and we very quickly go over what they learned. I'm talking less than five minutes, where I review and they can ask questions. Um, recently, I got into having the students teach. So now they are watching the videos at home, and they're coming in, and they're volunteering. They're fighting over who gets to teach the lesson, who gets to be the student teacher that day. So my students are teaching sixth grade math to their other um, peers. I do interject, of course, to make sure that they do understand the concepts that we were doing. And then we do homework, what, or what used to be homework, is classwork now. M the majority of my students get done what used to be homework in class. While they're doing that, I'm walking around and I'm helping them. If I see somebody is doing them wrong, I can stop them right there and say, look, you know, um, reciprocals for division, you forgot to flip your your second fraction. It, it's simple things like that, where they get immediate feedback on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. When students get done, they can go and help other students. This has really increased the, um, the scores and the understanding for my students. So where do you get the materials for the flipped classroom? Like I said, uh, online videos. If it's high school, you can use Khan Academy. I, once I make my videos, I put them on SchoolTube, so all of my videos are available to the public on SchoolTube. There are other videos on SchoolTube that I have used, um, TeacherTube, textbook videos. Every lesson in our textbook has a video to go with it, and they're only like three to four minutes long. I always try to put some type of online game on there because as soon as they get done taking all their notes, they want to play, and they want to play games. So they'll get on there and they'll practice. They have no problem spending 30, 45, 60 minutes playing a math game. But could I get them to do that, that multiplying of decimals sitting there for 60 minutes on their own with a worksheet? Absolutely not. But they come in the next day talking about how much time they spent on it and how well they did and comparing scores. Um, okay, so once you get the videos and you get all that done, then what do you do in class? I, I've been asked that question a lot. This frees up, it's not just about the videos, this frees up time for me to work with the students one-on-one. -on -one. So while I have students that are working on what used to be homework and, and is now classwork, I can sit down with, I also teach inclusion classes, I can sit down with my students, my inclusion students, and I can work with them. I can put three of them down there and we can take this and go slower. They've watched the videos, they've taken the notes, but they always need a little bit of extra help. This allows them to get that extra tutor time in, something that I didn't have time for before. Okay. And um, it's more timely. Instead of saying, oh, here comes progress and it's time to put progress reports in, well, instead of that student having to wait until they failed after the test, now you know right away who's um, doing well and who's not, and they know who's doing well and who's not, and they ask for the help when they need it. 
right? It's, it's really has made a difference for them because they do ask for the help. Hands go up. As soon as there's a question, the hands go up in the room. And not only am I helping them, but other students who understand it are going and helping. As far as my student performance, um, my, my math averages went from 72%, which I said I wasn't real happy the last few years. You know, C, C minus, not great in math. And I understand sixth grade was a lot of new concepts, but my math scores have jumped. My class averages in the beginning of this year jumped up to 81%. In um, the second quarter, it was even higher. In the second quarter, it was, I want to say, like 85 or 86% as a class average. I haven't had that. So I see it going up constantly. I don't get the homework complaints I used to. Oh, we got homework again. Do we have homework every night? Yes, you do, but your homework is to watch a video. Most of them not only finish the worksheet or whatever it is I have them doing in class, then they get on and they watch their ahas, their at-home assignments. They watch those videos and take notes in school, and when they go home, they don't have anything. They get it done. And because I'm there to help them, they're not spending an hour and a half doing math homework. A big thing when I started this at the beginning of the year was talking to parents. Um, open house, our open house was within the first couple days of school, and I told the parents that I was doing something very different, and I wanted to make sure that they understood what it was, and I explained the flipped classroom to them. I expected some of them to be upset. They looked relieved. I don't know how many of them came up to me and said, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to help my kid with homework anymore. They didn't know how to do it. They said, I don't know how to help them. They're, they're doing things that I did in high school, things that I haven't done since high school. Okay, when they're working with algebra and equations, I don't know how to do that. So this has really helped. Make sure you have a plan for um, open communication with the parents on that. Also make sure that you understand that there are times when the Internet doesn't work at home. My students have, um, I, I, the, the, my policy is, if your Internet isn't working, have your parent write a note. Parents write a note, they come in, usually they'll watch the videos then at the beginning of my class. Um, I, I, after we've done a little bit of teaching, they'll watch the videos and we'll catch them up from there. I also have run across where one student doesn't have internet. Out of all, all my math classes, there's only one student. That one student, um, I, I have a couple of options for them. I can put my videos into what we call our drop boxes or our handouts and they can drag them onto their desktop this way they have the videos there. They don't have to go to our learning management system, which is online. And we also have videos from the book that are on disk. So you can, I can, she, she also brings in a um, USB drive, and I will put them on there for. So there's a lot of different options for the students that don't have internet at home. This particular student, her mom, they, they live close to a place where they have free Wi-Fi. And so she said, a lot of times my mom will tell me, just go sit at McDonald's if she doesn't want to do it that way. So there's a couple different options. All right. We're looking for questions from you. Is there anything you feel that you want to ask that we haven't answered? Yes. Good question. Um, because I was scared to death. <laughs> Last year when I thought about this, I, I, I mentioned it to my principal in May. And she said, it's a great idea, do it. And I went, okay, but I don't know what I'm doing. And I didn't want to bite off more than I can chew. I will be honest, this summer when I made the videos, I did the first six weeks of my curriculum over the summer, and I actually took a course through a university that allowed me to write my curriculum and I got credit for doing that. Had I not been doing that, I probably would have scrapped the idea because I kept going, oh God, this is too hard. <laughs> it was a lot of work we to get started. Once I got started and I figured out what I was doing, I was okay. But I was also at the same time learning um, how to use the learning management system so I was teaching myself where this year as a trainer, I'm teaching people how to use it. This summer, I was learning how to use it at the same time. Next year, there's a good chance that I will. 
flip my science also. There's a free version that you can try online. Um, there is a cost to it, and that's where we joined the consortium, and it brought our total down. We don't have any trouble with that. Yes, that was in um, Mr. Brock's your stop motion video. The beginning. Which part? I'm sorry. The very beginning. Is this the okay. iMovie that's in the mail? Yep. The 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 one that was the the documentary that I used for example. Or? Yeah, it was it was all just on the, on the on the computer to go with so. We've, we've got a cool studio to use some of the technology and stuff, but just having all the Macs have the camera in it, so they just have the technology right there that they can beep, boop, beep, and be done. And our students really love doing movies of themselves. If they can do a movie of themselves for every assignment, they will. I've seen a number <laughs> of their projects end up on YouTube. They're so proud of it. They're like, all right, let's share it with everybody. Share all the things. Like, it's fantastic. They want to present everything. Can we present? Okay, we don't need to present everything that we do. Um, there is an option where they can go ahead and copy it and the students can type in it, but that's not a self-graded. So if we use the assessment piece in Brain Honey, it's a self-graded piece. I'm sorry. I don't think so. I don't know that anybody's had particular success importing um, the question bank. I mean, it may be possible, but that's the, the We've been fortunate that it is something where once, like if I create one, a course or an assessment, it can be shared among everybody. And um, that course can be copied multiple times. So I can show you an example of what our brain honey looks like, if you'd like. The green That's the beauty of Brain Honey. I put the videos in Brain Honey, and the next day when I come in, I pull up my um, grade book, and I put it in there that they have to watch it for 10 minutes. I also have where they have to take notes. So I walk around, and I look, and I make sure they have their notes. And they, then I can look on there, and I can see that it, it puts a check if they were in there and watching it for that 10 minutes. Now, if they're just sitting there, like if they put their computer on and they walk away, it shuts it down. So they actually have to be active in it for that 10 minutes. Also, um, I randomly pick, uh, you know, I, they walk in and I, even though a lot of them volunteer, I just, I, a lot of times I'll pick someone whose hand isn't up and I'll say, all right, you're my student teacher today. If they didn't watch it, you still got to get up and teach. I said, if I walked in here without doing, you know, not, not preparing for my class, I'd still have to teach. So if you walk in here and you didn't prepare for my class, you're still responsible for teaching it. And that has not happened. They are, they want to teach. They want to get up there. <laughs> yes. Actually, um, in the beginning, I was the only one. But I have more teachers now that are coming and watching my classroom. I'm amazed at how many are coming to see what it is. And they're wanting to get into it. We also got, the, we, we had Brain Honey this year, so the teachers were learning how to use that. We do have some at the high school, I think more at the high school that are using it now, am I correct, Lisa? And um, high school and elementary, but we have four waiver days that were offered, and to learn the learning management system, um, we gave those days as we're gonna learn how to use Brain Honey and you're gonna create at the same time. So when you were finished, you have something. So this is an example of the second grade, but I can show you just the list of courses we have on our subdomain that we have created this year. And it's a pretty extensive list. How much they're using it varies. And it's not generating anything. There we go. So these are the classes that we've um, put in ourselves. So created. these are the ones that the teachers created, actual courses in Brain Honey for the students. 
our Florida virtual schools are all housed here too, so our courses for that are in. And I'm having a little trouble here because uh, there is more. We're only at B. <laughs> but it's taking a minute for me to scroll through. We can tie it to state standards in the core. So it does have um, both options. Uh, we're talking about going ahead and making our core curriculum maps, using it, and then plugging in the activities. Actually, every question that I put in for my math, um, when it, it, I drag a standard over and put it on it, and every time my students do that, it either, uh, I, I put it in as assessing or as teaching it. And it shows up how many times they're, they're learning that. So it keeps track of that. You can do it, like, like she said, question by question. This question applies to this standard, or you know, this unit Whole applies groups. to these standards. Or I mean, it's it's pretty variable in math, so you can scale it. And it'll tie it all the way down. So it'll tell you how many times. Like here's the example of first grade, and we've just started tying them in. But you can see um, the standards are over on this side. Um, I had to link them to the different activities that I have over here. And then I can actually go and tie it to um, specific questions. Then I can go ahead and look um, how many times I've covered it, how many times I've assessed that. Yes. Yeah, you want to give them yours? Yes, um, I'm Al Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, at vermilionschools.org. And you can find all of us at the, our emails for on the, our school website, vermilionschools.org. Any other questions? Thank you.